I'm honored to be here. Let me, all right, I'm honored to be here. Thank you very much for having me. Um, and I will uh, just jump right into it. Let's not bury the lead, right? Um, so I'm a former prisoner uh, and not the romanticized kind that you read about or see in movies. Um, multiple prison terms, uh, serious drug addict, um, not a lot of hope uh, <clears throat> in my life for many years. Um, and then uh, it all kind of came to a head. Uh, it was the eighth time I'd been sentenced to prison and uh, they just sentenced me to four years. And uh, I was having kind of a, um, I don't know, a mental crisis, I guess you could say. Uh, it had been, eight, it was my eighth prison term. I was in my thirties at the time, early thirties. Uh, and I had genuinely kind of given it a chance uh, prior to that arrest. Uh, tried really hard to um, do what I wanted to on my terms. You know, I, I still wanted to live the lifestyle um, and it just resulted in me going back to prison. So uh, I came to this uh, epiphany. I kind of had this realization at the beginning of those four years uh, that it wasn't what I wanted to do anymore. I didn't know how to get myself out of it. I didn't know how to change my life. I didn't know how to get on another life path. Um, all I knew was that I didn't want the one that I was on. Um, so I was willing to do whatever it took, um, to change it. Um, I did have a bit of a religious experience. Um, so I spent basically those four years, uh, on a level four prison. That's the highest level prison that they have. Um, doing a relatively short amount of time with, uh, prisoners that weren't going home. That's, that's how I did all my time. I got in a lot of trouble. Um, so, you know, I went to the higher security levels. Um, during that prison term, uh, I did a lot of daydreaming, a lot of re reading, a lot of daydreaming, a lot of uh, wondering what I was going to do when I got out. Um, school was always in my the back of my head, um, but it didn't seem like a reality for me. Uh, just the way I grew up and, and with the family life that I'd had, I just didn't it was one of those things uh, I could do it, but I never really believed in it. Um, during that last prison sentence, uh, the last two years, I had the opportunity to attend a vocational training class uh, to be an electrician. Um, I remember I was really excited because I, I, I thought, oh, okay, this is going to be the thing. Uh, I'm going to become an electrician. I'm going to live this great electrician life, and I'll never have to you know, do all the things I did again. Um, I met well, the teacher that taught the class, uh, he's an amazing teacher. And it was the first real time that I felt like uh, I was more than just a criminal. Um, I, I was doing really well. It was a mix of book work and hands-on. And I was doing really well uh, with both the work, book work and hands-on. Um, and I got to this math section, uh, just the, the math behind DC and AC electricity. And uh, <clears throat> I was good at it. I, like I caught on quickly. Um, so this teacher, uh, he he nurtured that. Um, he would bring me in workbooks uh, that had to do with math. He would direct other inmates to come to me uh, when they needed help with the specific the math specific to the to the vocational training. Um, that led to other inmates coming to me, you know, on the yard in the building, asking for help with like algebra classes that they were taking through the mail and stuff. And so over this year and a half, I, I want to say suddenly I had um, a little bit of a different identity. Uh, at that time, I had tattoos across my face, my forehead, my eyebrows, um, my hands. Um, it was very, I was obviously a prisoner. Uh, you know, when I was not in prison, everybody knew that that's where I had been recently. Um, but I started coming through this change. I started feeling like uh, I was more than that. Um, I, this relationship I had with this teacher, which I still uh, we share emails every now and then still. Um, he, he, he got me thinking about school in a real way. Um, and then I, and then I was released. Uh, I was lucky enough to have my father and my stepmom who were there for me. And, uh, my first, my first inclination was to just go take this college, uh, algebra class that I needed to take to be a, to join the electrical union. And so I went in and, um, I went into, it was actually up north, Sierra College. Uh, I want to say it's outside of um, Roseville, near Sacramento. 
and I took their um, placement test and I, and I did rather well. I did a lot better than I thought I would. Um, and then before starting at Sierra, uh, my family, my parents had to move. And so I went with them and we went down to solving. <clears throat> so when I got down to solving, I started looking at schools. Allen Hancock College uh, came up and I remember thinking, you know, I can always become an electrician. Um, I did really well in the placement and I really enjoy math. And I kind of had something to prove. Um, so I decided I was going to do what to me was the most complicated major available. And that was computer science. Um, and that's how I entered Allen Hancock College. Um, I'll never forget my first meeting with Angelica. I told her that I wanted to uh, major in computer science. And uh, we talked about my uh, previous school credits, high school, junior high and everything. And we went through the, uh, she built me an education plan. And I remember there were so many classes, so many math classes in a row. Uh, several of them were uh, uh, remedial. Uh, I had to take geometry. I had to take um, algebra two and stuff like that. And uh, I remember leaving her office and I wasn't discouraged, but I do remember at the time thinking, you know, I've never been out of prison longer than six months. And I just, I just wasn't sure. I just wasn't sure. Um, I did talk to her years later about it, and she said that uh, when I left their office, she was concerned that she might have turned me off with all of those math classes. Um, but I was determined. Um, I was very determined. I was uh, your non-traditional student, which you could also call the new traditional. I was a little bit older, um, and I, I didn't have anything else in my life. That's, that was the thing that drove me. Was um, At that point, it was you know, school. Or I don't know. Uh, so leaving prison, I had accumulated a lot of baggage. Um, I started getting incarcerated young, like an early teen early teenager, and all of the I went through all of I went through a lot uh, juvenile hall placements, county jails, prisons, different counties, you know, uh, different states actually. And uh, when I showed up, I just I knew that I needed to shed it all and I needed to relearn how to live in life. Hancock was a place that from the very beginning I felt safe and um, it let me it let me kind of bloom. I, I want to say that I bloomed. I went through a lot of uh, growing and a lot of changes. Um, I learned a lot about myself. Um, I made wonderful relationships. And so that's that's kind of one of what I what I would like to talk about. I'd like to talk about how I was able to overcome some of the baggage um, that I had, uh, some of the um, techniques that I used to get through uh, school. And uh, I wanna share some of, the, some of the tips that I think uh, are helpful, especially if you're um, majoring in computer science. Um, we'll talk a little bit about Channel Islands and then, I, then I'll go on about what my daily life is like um, as a software engineer currently. So um, going into to Hancock College, um, I want to say that the most important thing was I felt a sense of um, responsibility for my own education. I knew that um, I knew that I was going to need to learn it, and I was going I was going to need to learn. I was going to need to learn how to learn. Um, I, I have ADD tendencies. I'm easily distracted. Uh, and I'm also easily frustrated um, when I can't get something. I feel like I'll never get it and I'll never understand it and I'll get upset. And I might, you know, so many times I wanted to just drop a class in the second week because I didn't understand something, you know. Um, and that started that started second semester. Uh, first semester was was kind of uh, getting used to school. I, uh, I, I was seeking out clubs. Um, the science, I believe it was the science and engineering club at the time, um, the STEM center, Mesa, uh, I'd heard about it. I'd read about it. I knew that I was a student that could benefit from the resources. Um, and, and like I said, I, I knew that I had to relearn things. Uh, I was a computer science student, you know, so I felt like I needed to surround myself with other people that were, um, taking STEM classes and such. Um, the first two, uh, the first two semesters, that's that's what I did. I just I got I felt I became part of the campus. I, I felt like I fit in. Um, 
when I said that I felt safe there, I really mean it. It was, it's, it's still probably the only place where I feel like I can just be myself and that I belong is kind of in the academic setting. Um, I'm, I feel comfortable at work and in industry also, but, but I really felt like I was able to, to just be free at school. And that was important to me. Um, some of the things that I had to do uh, that, were, that were tough was um, putting on blinders. You know, I had to focus on school. I had to make very difficult choices on um, my scheduling, you know, my free time. I had to say no to a lot of um, family functions, uh, partially, mostly because I needed to focus on school and study, partially because I was still struggling in large, large groups, mixed company, stuff like that. Um, yeah, I went through that a lot at the time. Uh, blessed, though, because my dad kind of understood it and he never gave me too hard of a time for it. He was he was also in that mindset of just letting me be me and letting me figure things out on my own. Um, I studied a lot and um, studying alone was pretty boring. Um, so I did. I suck. I I love to study in the STEM and Mesa Center. Sometimes they would break out into, you know, joking and messing around. But I mean, we always uh, we always were able to we were working on the, the whiteboard, whether or not we were joking around or not. We were always getting stuff done. Um, so many times we'd go off on tangents that had nothing to do with the problems we were working on. Uh, there was a, a good crew, a good crew of students um, at the time. I'm still in contact with several of them. Um, some of my favorite memories are, you know, one o'clock in the morning at somebody's house on a whiteboard, uh, working on problems that have, like I said, weren't assigned to us or anything. Um, yeah, it was fun. Uh, I started reading and, and looking up, you know, what do I need to do while I'm in school? What's this? What's that? Um, I heard that tutoring, tutoring made you a better student. So, you know, I, I wanted to become a, a tutor. Um, it was rough. It was rough. A lot of people come in and they really just want you to do their homework. Um, and it was during that I learned how to say no. It was rough. I get frustrated real easy. But um, I tutored for a couple years and uh, I felt more part of the STEM family and the Hancock family uh, doing it. I felt like I was helping other people. And it also solidified, uh, it solidified things in my head. You know, if you, if you really want to learn something, tutor it. If you really want to understand something, program it. You know, that's, that's, another, that's another thing. Uh, you know, some of these complicated math problems that you learn, maybe Calc 2 when you're doing uh, your integration and such, you really want to understand what's going on? Try, try to code it. Don't use a library. Uh, try to try to really put it together yourself. Um, so I was I was doing a lot of that. Um, I started hearing about um, scholarships and grants. Uh, Dom had the seismic going on back then, um, and so I got involved with seismic. Absolutely loved it. Um, the book um, uh, mindset. I'll never forget the book mindset. It didn't read the whole thing but I read a lot of it and uh, that's it right there. If you have the time, if I were you, I'd, I'd give it a go. Um, it really is about the state of mind that you're in. Um, but I was really hard on myself. Uh, I was really hard on myself. I felt like it was all or nothing and that I had to win. So I was really struggling and grinding to get A's. A plus. I had to get 100%. Uh, my goal on everything was 100%. And um, while keeping the blinders on, and, you know, being at the time two, two and a half years out of prison, you know, um, that worked for me. That actually worked really well for me. Um, I was clean off drugs. I, I wasn't tempted. Um, I didn't want to be involved in crime. There was things way more important to me. Uh, and, um, and that really worked for me uh, until it started to take its toll. Uh, when, you, when you put too much pressure on yourself, it, it's, it starts to mess with your head. And so, um, I don't want to say like I started being in bad moods all the time, but I, I felt like things were getting hard. Life was getting hard. I had to learn to live life. Um, my wife currently uh, was my girlfriend at the time. And, uh, you know, she's the first non-criminal uh, uh, relationship I'd ever had. So I was, I was just learning to be a person again. Um, I started looking for internships. Um, internships were very important. I'll actually talk about internships for a second right now. So um, 
I don't know if, if you've ever, if anybody's ever looked at the um, uh, job listings for any type of developer or engineer, software engineer type of job, um, the entry level jobs, they're asking for like eight years of experience of in this or that. It's it's kind of a meme that we like to joke about now, but but it's accurate. You see things entry level, uh, four years of MySQL, you know, eight years of Python. Uh, I've seen I've seen ads for jobs where they want five more years experience in a specific technology than the technologies actually existed. It's crazy. Um, I my uncle sent me one. I don't remember which one it is right now, but it was something where they wanted so much experience. And then the guy who actually wrote the language or wrote the specification for it, like tweeted it out and said, well, I guess I'm not going to be able to get this job. Um, it was yeah, just little things like that. So I started looking into internships and um, internships, in my experience, they kind of come in two flavors. Um, well, first of all, internships 100% count for work experience, especially when you're getting out of school. Uh, employers understand that you just got out of school and you don't have any experience. So they look towards the internships, right? And so internships count. Uh, and I've, in my experience, I've noticed there's two, two flavors of internships. You've got the internships, which are provided through a university or a school. They're more of like an academic thing where, you know, they'll take a certain number of students from everywhere and you get to go and you, you learn, you participate. It's, it's kind of half school and, and half working. Um, those are great. Those are especially great in uh, community college because at that point you may not have really started taking any core classes. Um, maybe you've only taken fundamentals one or fundamentals two uh, when it comes to programming and stuff. Those are excellent. Um, I, I was able to, uh, to um, participate in a couple of those um, and, and I love them. Uh, they prepare you for the real world. They give you an idea of what's going on. Um, without really requiring um, skill from you. So it's kind of like everybody's, if you get accepted, everybody seems to be on the same playing field and you can get a lot from it. Um, so that's, that, that was kind of my focus at Hancock. Um, towards the end there, uh, I took a, um, well, no, let's back up a little bit. So I got accepted to Berkeley, um, you know, full ride, all the, everything tuition paid for, everything paid for, it would have, wouldn't have cost me much, I think a meal plan or something. Um, and the summer before I was supposed to go, I went up to Stanford and as part of a, as part of an internship uh, situation. And um, in the end, I didn't, I ended up not finishing the internship. I got through half of it and then I came home. Uh, I'd recently been married. Um, and uh, at that point, there was a lot happening in my head. Um, I, over the years, I've had a lot of, um, friends and acquaintances pass away, uh, more now that I'm out of that lifestyle, um, a lot since, um, I was released from prison in 2015, a lot. And, uh, I had been recently married. Life was, was great. I had all these opportunities and it kind of all just got me at once. And then, um, I had word that another one of my friends had passed away. So I was in a really bad headspace at the time. Um, I did uh, take as much advantage of, of the internship. I loved it. I was working in the uh, geophysics department up there, automating, um, auto, just automating things, Python, automate everything. Um, loved it. Absolutely loved it. Working closely with, um, with Professor uh, Dunham up there. Uh, it was an amazing, amazing experience. Uh, but when I came back from that, uh, talking with my wife, she was unable to uh, move up there with me because her career was here. And at the time, she just wasn't able to um, to shift locations. And so I, I made the hard decision not to go to Berkeley. I didn't want to go by myself. Um, I had a couple friends go up there and uh, some of them loved it, but a couple of them uh, described it as intimidating. Uh, big difference, I think. Those big universities, they say that um, if you're the type of person that needs uh, or that enjoys or wants more one-on-one -on -one time with professors, um, you might not have that same experience at the larger universities. So kind of a little bit of mix of everything. Um, in the end, I thought, you know, I'll, I'll just stay local. Um, I think Cal Poly actually was my focus. Um, so I came back to Hancock, did a part-time year uh, or a part-time semester, uh, took discrete um, with uh, Pavone. And then uh, I took one semester off, and that was 
scary for me. Everybody that I talked to, even if they were smiling and telling me they supported my decision, um, I could tell that they didn't think I was going to come back. I guess there's a lot of stories about people that want to go take that one semester off and wind up not coming back. So um, knowing that, keeping that in my head, I was determined to come back. But um, I was working. Um, I wanted to work uh, for that semester. I was working in uh, Pismo Beach, doing the uh, working at Harry's, working at the door and behind the bar at Harry's. Uh, was it night club, uh, nightclub and beach bar? Um, and that was kind of that was cool too. I kind of got an idea. I was living the life that I'd never lived before, and uh, made a lot of friends. And during my time there, like it was great um, having that time off and, and really kind of exploring what I wanted to do. I spent a lot more time in the water with my kayak, something that I daydreamed a lot about in prison. Um, spent a lot of time with my wife, uh, my dog, and um, I kind of just enjoyed myself. Um, and then it was time to go back to school. So I applied for one school only, and that was Cal Poly. And that was probably the worst decision I ever made. Because then Cal Poly said no, uh, which surprised me, uh, really surprised me. But what can you do? So um, I was really concerned at that point. I wasn't sure what I was going to do. Do I wait another year and then just uh, apply to other schools? Do I take classes in the meantime? Uh, luckily, um, I was contacted by, I believe it was the Regents, CSU Regents or something. And uh, they said, you know, we noticed that you didn't get accepted to anything. Uh, but you've done this, this work. Uh, here's a list of three schools that have openings. Choose one. And I, I think it was uh, Bakersfield, Channel Islands, and maybe Dominguez Hills, something like that. I, I can't really remember the third one. Um, I chose Bakersfield. <laughs> and uh, they emailed me back and told me, sorry, that one's closed up now too. So Channel Islands it was. <clears throat> I grew up out here uh, in Ventura County. I know Ventura County very well. Um, so yeah, I came to Channel Islands, uh, and, and that was that, that was kind of the, uh, the shift from, um, community college to real university. So, uh, it was a little bit intimidating, but something I found, uh, that's very helpful when you're nervous and intimidated and you don't know what to expect is you go to all the things that they plan for you. So, um, just like I tried to participate in everything that I could at Hancock, I went straight into Channel Islands doing the exact same thing. Um, I went to maybe three school events before the semester started. Um, I, did, I drove to the university, just walked around it a couple times. Um, I did the thing where you go to each one of your classes, take a picture of the door, send it to my dad. Hey, look, this is where I'm going to go to class, you know. Uh, just really excited. Uh, nervous because I didn't know what to expect. Um, and But very excited. Um, so, so that's what I'll, I'll shift into that now. So um going into uh so i told you about i told you there's two flavors of internships okay i've given you one flavor so far it was at university level where i began to um, understand that second flavor of internship so uh one thing um that's different about the cal state university system from my understanding but specifically channel islands from my experience was that the teachers are all in industry um every one of my teachers in my core classes uh, specific computer science core or computer science elective, every one of them had some type of amazing job in industry. Um, the same way that I was making um, relationships or I was, I, was, I, was, I was building relationships with teachers at Hancock, um, I immediately started building relationships with my teachers at Channel Islands. Um, some teachers didn't want a relationship at all. <laughs> some of them were difficult to talk to. But that's part of the process, because once you get into industry, not everybody's going to want to talk to you either. But um, so I, I started making uh, I started building these relationships, um, started getting to know other students. Um, it was kind of difficult being a transfer student because a lot of the students had already been there a couple of years. A lot of them had already been uh, had already known each other. They went to high school together, um, you know, and then I showed up and. Uh, and. First couple of weeks was kind of rough new guy stuff, but then I started getting to know people and um, started working in groups and stuff. I, I actually, for one of the first things I did was I wanted to know about the um, clubs, the computer clubs, uh, science clubs and stuff. Uh, found a couple clubs 
um, tried to get involved in one. Uh, I didn't feel like it was for me, so I kind of gave up on it. Um, had a couple good friends though, and uh, started um, started to fit in. I felt like I started to fit in and get comfortable. It was during my second semester that COVID hit, and COVID was rough. Uh, but I I think it might have just it might have been a blessing in disguise. Um, and that was around the time I started taking more advanced classes. And uh, two teachers uh, in particular uh, worked in industry. And um, as I just being my normal self and, and participating in class discussions and doing my best on my work, um, I started hearing about internships, different kinds of internships that were a little bit different. Um, the uh, internship that I wound up um, taking uh, it was because I had two different teachers. Um, one of them was more of the IT uh, teacher. Uh, I was taking a Unix uh, systems programming class with him. Uh, the other teacher uh, was, um, well, he was actually the dean of, or the chair of the computer science department. And uh, he, uh, he taught the software engineering class. Uh, he did pre-capstone, a couple other classes. And um, I, I got to know both of them pretty well. And one of them offered me an internship. And it was funny because, you know, he describes it to me. And then he says, uh, also, it's a, you know, Department of Defense contractors. So you got to be cool with working for the government. Oh, yeah. And you also have to have a clean record. And so that's when I was like, yeah, not getting that one. Um, so I was honest with him. Like, that, that's the thing. That's the thing about having so much baggage, right? When you got all the cards stacked against you, you can laugh about it and really not care. And you can just be honest about it all, you know? So I told him, I said, I don't, I don't know then if, that, if that's the case, man, I don't think it's going to work. I would love to, if we can move forward and do it, let's do it. Um, but I'm not sure it's going to work. And so he asked for details and I gave him details and uh, he went back to, um, you know, his bosses and his bosses said, absolutely not. Uh, and then a couple of weeks go by, I guess he tried again. Um, and they said no again. Well, unbeknownst to me, uh, that other professor that I was talking about, he's actually the principal scientist for the company. And um, he uh, had said that he needed to bring in some interns specifically for AWS cloud development. Now, at this time, uh, Channel Islands has a relationship with AWS. They currently do. Um, they are trying to expand it further um, through, I believe they called it the CSU-7. So the six other campuses they wanna include. But at the time I, I was participating in a pilot, pilot program. Um, I took a winter, a winter course uh, specifically on um, cloud solutions. Uh, it cost me $1,100 and uh, a, lot of, um, <clears throat> a lot of thinking and, and, and budgeting went into that. Conversation with my wife had to be had. Uh, we decided it was for the best, so I took it. And um, so, yeah, so this professor's, uh, you know, at the same time that one professor's trying to get me an internship and they're telling him no, this other professor is uh, letting everybody know that he needs a team of, um, of a, uh, interns. And so they tell him, give him a list, and, you know, they'll work it out. So he gives them a list and my name's on it. And they had no idea that I was the same guy that the professor uh, before was asking about that they'd already said no to. And they hired me. And uh, <laughs> they didn't realize I was the same guy till the second week. Um, but by then, by then, uh, my team lead, who he's senior leadership there, had said, no, 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 no. Uh, let's give this guy a chance. He's uh, good at what he does and he, he knows how to learn. He's, you know, teachable. And they gave me a chance. And uh, so that's the second type of internship. The second type of internship is a a when a company just wants to hire an employee um, and uh, not pay as much, you know, uh, a lot of uh, companies will use these uh, internships as a way to um, train uh, for after graduation they, to pick who they want. Um, I went in, uh, there might have been another seven interns beside me. Uh, several of us were offered um, full-time positions at the end of graduation. Some of us weren't, um, but that, that's kind of the, the go. Uh, it's not so much related to school. It's not through the school. Um, you can find internships uh, like that from companies just by 
uh, going through job ads, really. Um, I had seen several on, um, oh, I don't remember the name of the site, Glass, Glassdoor, just the normal job search sites. If you type an internship, you'll, and you, you'll see them. Um, so that's like the second type of internship. I, that from day one, the very first day, I was writing code. I was developing software. Um, it was really cool. It was a lot different than previous internships because I was legit a software engineer. Uh, just without the title. Um, I was on a team. I had to pick tickets from a Jira board. I had to understand Git. I under had to understand uh, uh, Bitbucket. We were using Bitbucket instead of GitHub. Um, you know, uh, something that I knew this to be true, but it still surprised me. They say professional developers, uh, you only really write a couple lines of code a day on average. Um, I was writing hundreds of lines of code a day but not all of it was getting merged into the code base. You know, on average, I'm sure it was like two lines of code a day, but um, full, full on software engineer. It was amazing. I was working directly with and alongside my teachers. Uh, the principal scientist was actually on my team. My, I was taking a course with him during the day, um, some days of the week. And on other days of the week, we were code reviewing each other. Like, it was a pretty amazing situation. Um, I didn't want to be a software developer. I didn't want to be a software engineer. Uh, originally, I wanted to be, yeah, I wanted, uh, it was physics simulations that interested me. I, I was, I wanted to move, I wanted, my plan was to go through my undergrad, finish my bachelor's degree, go on, get a master's or a PhD, some type of research. Um, I was kind of focused on physics at the time because I knew that there was a lot of coding that went into that. I enjoyed math. Um, I enjoyed trying to code math. Um, and I thought that was a good fit for me. Um, I, but again, uh, my time at Channel Islands kind of opened my eyes to different things. Um, I, okay, the semester previous to um, getting the internship at uh, GBL, I currently work at a, a company called GBL Systems uh, Corporation. Uh, right, just the semester prior to that, um, I was part of a HSI Smart Grant where I got to work on a research team led by one of my one of my other professors at Channel Islands. If you see, there's kind of a recurring theme and it, it's relationships with your professors, um, putting yourself out there, you know, applying. And uh, it was it was that it was that um, HSI Smart Grat research internship that made me realize I didn't want to do physics. Um, I was I was uh, using something called G what's the Jean 4, Jean 4. Uh, it's, it's a library that lets you do physics experiments with lasers pretty much. Um, you know, I spent a few months working with that and I realized that I really didn't like the physics part of it, but I was really loving the fact that I could take this third-party software and do this amazing stuff with it. Um, and that's kind of when I was like, okay, I, I think the software side of things, I think I'm, I think I'm with it. So yeah, anyhow, so um, that internship, I, I was an intern for, I want to say eight months total. Um, but two months into my internship, I got pulled into a meeting and I was told directly that, um, as long as everything kept moving forward as it was, that I would be getting a full-time offer upon graduation. Um, <clears throat> that was, that was fun. And that was hard. It was very hard because it started off as a, a summer thing, um, but you know, once the company once a company wants you, they try to keep a hold of you. So uh, they extended my internship uh, to part time, and I finished off uh, the last the last of my uh, bachelor's degree, uh, going to school full time and uh, working at GBL Systems uh, part time. Um, I graduated from Channel Islands to, uh, with the highest GPA in my class. Um, I didn't know about that actually until graduation day. Uh, it was pretty amazing. Um, I think that the only, oh, and then <laughs> I think another, it's good and bad. So COVID hit and we went to remote learning. Um, on one hand, that's rough. It's really hard to learn when you have all the distractions that you have at home um, around you. Uh, but that's it's part of staying focused. Um, I know that listening to the people 
um, hiring at my at my work. I like to um, I like to pick their brain whenever I can. Um, one of the things was um, they were looking for students who uh, were able to continue uh, without that they were able to go from in person learning to remote learning and still keep the quality of their work the same. They were looking for students who knew how to learn remotely. Like that was a big deal. Um, they were looking for students who um, were able to take what they knew and apply it. Um, so I never had to go through the interview at GBL, but several of my friends did. And um, it's, it's, it's basic questions. Uh, let's see, what's a good one? Um, oh, a very basic one. This, so you'd be surprised how many people get this wrong. Um, something to the effect of uh, if you had two arrays with data and you wanted to combine them into a single data structure uh, that would be easier to work with, what would you use? And I that threw a lot of people. That threw a lot of people. Um, believe it or not, the interviewer told me that he was willing to just, if you just asked him a question, just ask for further further clarification on it. And he, he even if you didn't have an answer and you, or you got it wrong, he was willing to give you credit for it, you know? Um, by the way, the answer is like a dictionary or a hash map or something, uh, an object, chase an object, something. Um, so yeah, uh, I got seriously involved with the NetSec um, club at Channel Islands. Uh, my first semester, I became the CTF captain. I don't know if you guys have heard of CTFs, uh, capture the flag. It's uh, kind of a game. Um, it's, yeah, it's a game. Uh, it's kind of a security, computer security style game. Um, if you haven't, if you haven't, Pico CTF is a good place to start. Uh, I think we actually have a team right now that's playing around with some of the Pico stuff. Uh, the club's name was NetSec, short for Network Security. Uh, I did the first semester as the um, CTF captain, and then I did my second semester as the president, um, and then I graduated. Um, all of the students that I was in the club with are all working in industry um, with good jobs, and we all we're all still friends. Um, the the professors that we were close with uh, at the time we're still close with, close with. It's a network, um, and I think that's a that's one of the important um, concepts. I think is that from the time you start school going forward, there's other students that are going to be in other positions near or far from you. There, you eventually you're going to see people you went to school with on hiring teams, or you're going to be on a hiring team. You know, and, and relationships are important. Um, but yeah, so I'm going to shift out of that now, and I think I'm going to talk about actual industry. Uh, unless there's any questions. I can answer more at the end, or I can take some now. So you mentioned you did some CCF events with a club, uh, and I'm actually a member, a, a board member of the Developers Guild at Hancock, and oh. we're trying to figure out, uh, we just want to try and get people to come together. We're trying to do, um, what's the name of the website? We just started this club over the last uh, few weeks, and we're trying to get like up and running we have what is it called hacker something oh is it like hacker uh rank yeah hacker rank. I've heard so of it. we're doing stuff with like hacker rank and stuff we were just wondering if there's any uh local events that you know about where we could uh just like i don't know show up and compete and like see what other people are yeah. doing what other clubs are doing on the central coast and so i don't know of any of uh, like get togethers or meetups or anything um I do, I can go through my Discord and I can um, I can email Dom or Christine. Do you want to add me on Discord? I can, so I can do that. What's your... Uh, I will send it to you in chat. Perfect. That works for me. Um, so all the CTFs we did were the remote ones. We did a lot that just recur every year. Um, off the top of my head, I can't, I can't think of any of them. Um, I, could, I would say this, though, is that if you guys are all trying to get together, I, I assume that you, there's varying skill levels yeah um, pico does have that pico playground PICO. yeah and uh the first few easy ones might seem too easy but that changes very fast that's so, what uh that's what our club president naomi was noticing about uh hacker i just said the name and i already forgot it hacker, hacker, rank? hacker yeah. rank yeah yeah they go from easy to hard real quick uh, gotcha. if it seems too hard all of a sudden it's because you're missing something small gotcha 
yeah but no definitely i can um i can get a list of stuff together and i can make sure that uh christine gets it and distributes it awesome um, yeah and then uh yeah just you can also send it to me on discord and that would be wonderful oh, that's right yeah i'll get that from the chat in a second all right thank you yeah no problem brother so uh industry now i can only speak i've only had one job in industry um I can only speak to my experience and I, and I can also say my experience might not be uh, the normal experience. So your mileage may vary, um, but uh, I love my life. I love my life. Uh, I wake up every day and I go to my desk and I log in and uh, well, no, let, let's back up. So well, where I work, um, they, their biggest customer is the defense. It's the defense industry, aerospace, cyber warfare, stuff like that. Um, it's the kind of place where if you don't, if you're not on the team, you don't know what, you don't even know that the team's there really, unless you're already in seen, like maybe senior leadership or you've been around for a bit. So um, I've been on uh, three teams now, uh, the original team I was hired to, um, and I've been on two other teams. I can say that all three of them are completely different, completely different. Um, the team that I'm, so be, today before this, I was working, uh, the team I'm on right now, um, I don't write any code. It's, it's kind of rough. Uh, I write reports. And uh, I was talking to Christine about it earlier. Uh, it's just one of those things that you gotta do. It's a skill set that you learn. And it 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 makes you a more viable candidate for leadership or other jobs in the future. Um, so as you can imagine, when the, the military uh, contracts for a piece of software and the software is being developed, somebody needs to test it, right? And um, so right now, that's that's what I do. I read documentation, um, user guide, documentation, proposals uh use cases uh for a specific project um i get to know the project in and out uh i get the software baseline and then uh, my job is to install it and use it and then yeah install it use it and then based on the documentation and the guide what i do is i write a report um uh, basically stating what it does what it doesn't do what it's supposed to do that it's not that it that it doesn't do and what it does that it's not supposed to do i don't know if that makes sense to you but basically does it do what it's supposed to do and if not um how bad is that right i i say that i hate it it's very front and and i don't um it's just so different um but when you look on the bright side of it i'm actually being exposed to quality software from other companies, <clears throat> I get to see what other companies are putting out. I get to um, explore. I get to see different different ways. Just how do different people solve uh, similar problems, right? Um, one of the things that we do is we run uh, security scans on the code, and um, you know the security scan kicks out a nice large report: code smells, errors, things that can be fixed automatically, things that can't be fixed. Um, just reading those reports uh make you a better developer uh you don't even realize certain things are a problem um right now surprisingly a, a big thing in a lot of these public like javascript packages are um um regex ddoses or not ddoses regex doses um writing us being able to create a, a a regular expression string that when you pass it in it breaks everything and lets you run coid run code uh um, code execution, remote code execution, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, it makes you a better developer. But the other teams I was on were fun. Um, one is uh, specifically a web app, uh, full on um, Amazon Web Services um, um, back end. So yeah, I took a class on it. Um, I was, I've actually, so I've, I've taken one class, the Solutions Architect Classing class. Um, solutions architecting. I took another class for my pre capstone um, that had AWS Academy embedded into it. Um, I've taken a couple AWS Academy courses, the machine learning, software development, um, and the solutions architect one. 
Um, loved it. So jumped into this team. And so my daily, this is my daily schedule from the beginning was, uh, you know, I log in. So there's some security stuff you got to go through. Boom, boom. You log in. Uh, you, we use um, Bitbucket and Jira. And I don't know if Bitbucket's a lot like GitHub. Jira is a way of, um, it's like a Jira board. It's a way of, of it's a ticketing system. Uh, some movies and TV shows you used to see developers would walk up to an actual physical board and pick a ticket and the ticket's like, oh, you have to implement this feature, right? Uh, maybe it's a website that needs, um, you know, you're building a search, a search, a search con, a search modal for it or something, searching through some database for names of something, right? Names of a company or something like that. So, you, you know, you pull your ticket, it's scored as a score, um, it's numerical. Um, what the numbers mean are different from uh, team to team, but for the most part, like on my team, you'd have a score anywhere from one to 13. Um, 13 was a very difficult ticket. Anything over 13 is should be broken down into smaller tickets is kind of how the agile method, that's what we do. It's agile method of um, software development. Um, but it's one to 13. One is like, uh, you know, already know what you need to do. It's just a matter of a couple lines of code uh, and then it's done, right? So, <clears throat> So what I'll do is I'll pick a ticket. Okay, this is what I'm going to do today. Um, then I create a Git branch off of the main development branch. I only add or remove the code that I need to for my ticket, um, and then it's committed. Um, we don't merge into development yet, though. So the idea is you work in two two week sprints, or at least our workflow, uh, two week sprints. Um, at the end of the two weeks, we have what's called sprint review. And you, we go to the board as you finish a ticket or you grab a ticket, you move it from to do to in progress. Once you think you're done, you move it from in progress to um, um, review. And then those sit in review until the end of the sprint. It's two week cycle is called a sprint. Um, at the end of the sprint, everybody takes turns. You, um, it's code review time, right? You don't get to just merge code in because you think it's done, especially when you're an intern. Um, I've broken stuff. I've really broken stuff. But um, so that's what we do. We go over the code. Everybody on the team has all eyes on it at the same time. Uh, you explain what you did and why. Um, you will most likely not merge code without them wanting things changed. Um, I mean, you have to code to a style guide. When you're, when you're actually doing professional software, um, the PEP8 and stuff for Python, for example, um, the way that you name variables, the way that you indent, uh, the way that you name classes, uh, your doc strings, um, the way that you import. Uh, if you're importing uh, some custom file or something uh, relative uh, with a relative path, it has to go here. If it's if some native Python, it goes here. Um, just a lot, of, a lot of stuff like that. There's a lot more to it than just writing code. So during the code review, you know, all eyes are on it. Um, they make tasks for you, right? So they'll say, okay, you know, it looks good other than A, B, and C. So at the end of at the end of the sprint review, um, you go back, you uh, you fix or you add, you do whatever it is, whatever your task is for that um, for that ticket. Uh, once that's done, commit. You let everybody know. There's a quick glance. The code gets merged into the development base, and you cheer. Um, the first, that first pull request, that very first one, when your code actually becomes part of the overall software code base, it feels so good. It is, uh, it's one of those defining moments. Um, and it's funny because I remember how great I felt. Uh, and then six months later, seven months later, we get new interns coming through and I'm sitting there watching them on their very first, you know, pull request. And, it, and, and you're like, all right, cool, let's merge it. You hit the merge button. And then you help hear people in the background. Yes. You know, it's just, it's the funniest thing. Um, but it's exactly how I felt. You know, it's, it's exactly how I felt. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of how it is when you're, you know, software engineer level one or software engineer intern. Um, when you're new to the company, that's, that's pretty much what you're doing. Uh, a lot of the tickets can be things like, investigate slash research how to go about doing this. Um, that'll be one ticket. Uh, 
oh, I'm sorry. When I told you we do code review and everybody's going over everything, uh, on my team, we also had to create a slide deck, a PowerPoint slide deck. So for, for every single, it could just be one slide. Um, oftentimes it was, you know, five or six. Um, the team I was on, we were doing the first um, cloud project at the company at the time. Um, so the, there was a, a need, there was a very important need for documentation. Um, so every ticket had a PowerPoint slide deck that went with it. Um, now the research tickets were more important. And I think that my, my having had experience with research, um, so the Channel Islands uh, research internship I was on, the Stanford um, internship that I did. They re that's where they, those really came into play and I was very appreciative of them. That's where Mr. Jorstad, that's when I started emailing him, telling him, man, thank you for being so crazy when I would do PowerPoint presentations because everything he said came into play, every single thing. So yeah, I see you shaking your heads. If you hate those- I presented one today. Yeah, oh yeah, oh, you already did? Yeah, I just did my last one for the semester today. Yeah. So, Dom saw it. Dom was there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I've emailed uh, every now and then. Something will come up, and I'll think, "Oh yeah, George Dad was right." And I'll email him, and I'll tell him, "Give your students hell, man, because it's 100. It's applicable." Um, so yeah, like lots of PowerPoint presentations, especially when it has to do with research. Um, let's see. Can I come up with something? So. Yeah, I don't think there's anything off the top of my head I can really go into. But like I said, uh, everybody on the team, the interns, us interns at the time, we had more uh, experience with AWS than the developers that were already there because they've been out of school for however long they've been out of school. And the cloud is a thing that's now coming into industry and being a big deal. So when we, when me and the other interns showed up, we kind of had a leg up on them. It was like we, I understood what, Amazon Web Services provided. I understood the uh, the what's it called the best uh, the correct way of doing things, right? Uh, the way that Amazon said to do them. And then the guys that I work with, they were more experienced basically in everything else. Everything else that there was about being a software engineer, they had that. Um, became friends with them. Uh, I didn't really do the. I didn't really go through the um, imposter syndrome so much. Um, I expected that I would. I, I go through, I have it from time to time. Let me look at something real quick. Oh man, it's five o'clock. Um, I go through it from time to time, but uh, honestly, being a software developer and being a software engineer, it's kind of a club. Uh, and at work, you know, we're, it's not just engineers and software developers that work where I work. Uh, there's a lot of different positions. They do a lot of different things. Uh, but we're 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 kind of our club. We uh, we hang out together. We eat together. We joke. We have the same things that we like. Um, and I I feel like I'm res I feel like I'm respected for my. Not it's not, it's not for this. Not for what I know, but for the fact that um, I I know how to figure it out. I know how to learn it. Um, when you're coming out of school, companies, like I said, they don't expect you to know anything. Everything that you're learning right now in school, it's great. You have to know it. It's the foundations, right? But it's it's not like, oh, I know how to do this. I'm just going to be able to jump right into things. Uh, there's so much more involved, um, a lot of soft skills, a lot of hard skills. Um, yeah. So let me keep going real quick. So um, yeah, that was the beginning of it. it was tickets, getting tickets, uh, completing tickets. Um, and then eventually um, I became a team lead on that team, which was really cool. Uh, it doesn't, you don't make any more money, but you get a lot more responsibility. Um, you are the person that kind of guides the direction of the team. Um, so the person that writes the tickets that I was just talking about, you know, you, you got to know what needs to be done on a project. So you write the tickets. Um, your job as a team lead is to make is to be there for the rest of your turn team to make sure that what needs to get done they have everything they need to do what they need to do. Um, I bounced around the other team was really great that I was on wasn't so much Amazon Web Services. Um, 
I think it was a lot of machine learning. Um, I was on that team for a few months. I only pulled two or three tickets. Every single one of them was either a clustering algorithm or a labeling algorithm. Uh, nobody on that team knew, um, had ever had any experience with labeling or clustering. Um, so the two, the first two tickets were research into, um, man, I dove deep into those. Uh, I learned so much creating the slide decks uh, when I was on that team about how, like I said, labeling works, how clustering works, the different types of clustering algorithms, DB scan, uh, what's it, uh, KNN, uh, yeah, K-means, K-N-N and K-means are two completely different things, but they sound the same. Um, it's just so much stuff. And it was fun. And it was, I knew how to learn because, you know, I had to learn in school and uh, I just jumped right into it. Um, it was actually my performance on that team. After that, they gave me the team lead on the first team. So, yeah, so that's where I'm at now. Um, I really enjoy my job. Every day, I sit at my computer and I feel like I'm doing the exact same things that I would have been doing anyways. Uh, I like to lock myself in my room and play on my computer. And that's what I do. Uh, my wife works from home also. She's got the other bedroom. Um, and it's and it's nice, you know. Uh, in the beginning, I told you guys I had blinders on. I was always stressing myself out. I had to be perfect, 100%, this, that, the other. You know, just learn the material. Uh, it's easy to pass a class without learning the material. You can do it. Super fun. When you go in for that interview, it's going to be apparent that you don't know the material. Um, but there's a healthy like work-life balance now um, that I learned uh, at Channel Islands. Uh, at the end of my uh, Hancock time, I started really, because I was putting too much pressure on myself, I started to break. That's why I had to take that semester off and such. Uh, but that's when I realized that you have to have a healthy work-life balance. The blinders and stuff really worked for me in the beginning because I had to overcome that prison baggage. Um, but once I was able to kind of just figure it out, everything was so much more enjoyable. Um, I'm into camping. I like kayaking. Um, you know, some, some days I work, so, so I work, I have every other Friday off. Um, and so I, Dude, if once work ends on Thursday, I'm gone. So a lot of times I'll just pack my truck, drive up near some trailhead that I want to go to, sleep in the parking lot of some lo local Walmart, and then bright and early hit the hit the trail and I'm camping, you know? Um, it's really nice. And I'm grateful for every experience I had through Hancock and through Channel Islands uh, because I approach every situation looking for what I can learn from it. And I feel like everything that I needed to learn to be successful, I was able to pick up along the way. Um, we're in, an, we're in a, a time now where employers struggle to find employees that are willing to work, um, that are willing to grind. And, um, you know, when I say grind, I don't mean like killing yourself working and doing extra stuff. I mean, you have a job, whether you know how to do it or not, you stick with it, you see it to the end. Um, employers are really having a hard time finding that right now. So when they do find it, they pay it well. And they will, you'll find yourself climbing the hierarchy, the ladder, you know? Um, and it's nice. It's really nice. So I'm sure that I overlooked some stuff and I skipped things that I was really meaning to tell you guys about. Um, but I would love to answer your questions. Um, I think that your questions are more important than anything I had to say already, so. Yeah, I got a question. Um, so um, you majored in computer science and uh, I'm at like a crossroads right now where I'm thinking about computer engineering, computer science, mm -hmm. just cause um, I'm, I find in circuit, circuits and microprocessors a little bit interesting. Mm -hmm. um, how do you, what do you think as a person in the industry, like, and with your experience, do you think um, I'll be like shooting myself in the leg by going, by doing CE and then trying to get into the CS field, like as a software developer? Or does it matter more about the uh, projects and internships I've done, which aligns more with that field? Right. So what do you, I, I think the question is, like my, the question I have for you is, um, what do you want to do? 
do you want to work on hardware? Do you want to yeah. do both? Both, like I, I, I'm, I find like working on embedded systems really mm. interesting. At the same yeah. time, it's like, a, you know, yeah. So I, so I, I don't know. This is an opinion based. This is an opinion based question for me. But I can tell you this. I can say that uh, the developers and engineers that I work with um, at work, there are a few RF and embedded projects. Um, and the people that work on them have mixed degrees or it's just it's a it's a combination or it's a it's a mixture um i i don't know my opinion might be if you want to do ce go for ce but uh maybe when it comes time for electives or just to fill in units take some development classes take some uh, software development classes or something um and it does matter about your internships so even if you just stuck with the pure ce education um internship if you get an internship where you're not only you know working directly on hardware but then you're also writing the code that goes into the hardware that's going to get you a job doing just that when you get out of school okay yeah um yeah i, I i'd say it's not so much a it probably seems like a big a big decision right now but uh if you want to do it yeah do it i don't think you'll be shooting yourself in the foot get us yeah get a ce because part of the ce if I'm not mistaken, part of the CE education is a lot of code and software, right? It's yeah. like 50-50 electrical engineering and uh, computer science. So those I'd come together there. It. Yeah, I'd say go for it and then be particular about um, internships. And uh, yeah, so I see a lot of a lot of uh, RF. I see a lot of RF where I'm at, radio frequency stuff. So um, yeah, if that inspires you any, yeah. We got a lot of embedded systems you can imagine okay yeah so that's another so that's funny somebody asked me recently if i felt like um if i felt like um so i i'm a software engineer and i think cal poly has a software engineering major i think they have a degree directly in it so somebody asked me if i felt like uh maybe i should have um majored directly in software engineering instead of computer science I said, no, absolutely not. I, um, all right, making sure nobody, I thought somebody dropped a question. Um, software engineering follows under the umbrella of computer science. And so I, I feel like I would have, um, I would, I feel like the opposite would have been true. If I had only majored directly in software engineering, then I would have pigeonholed myself as a software engineer without uh a lot of um uh, lateral movement to kind of go to other um other niche computer science areas um to majoring in computer science you get a lot of the math a lot of the theory is involved so a little bit a lot of hands-on a lot of theory um whereas my understanding of software engineering majors it's a lot of um it's a lot of software and learning about learning about software engineering, like learning at learning the agile method in in depth. Um, yeah, yeah. I wish I like hardware, man. I, I went to Def I went to DEF CON a couple years in a row and uh, found myself um, gravitating towards the hardware hacking village. Uh, after my first DEF CON, I came home and spent like $300 on just everything I needed to do everything with a soldering iron. Um, I, still to this day, uh i have a desk out in the shed that's just covered in machinery and things that are taken apart my buddies from the net set club um the, one of them we get together he calls it our happy hacking weekend but uh we get together sometimes and he i'm fast i can i can solder very fast might not be the best solder joint but i can solder very fast and it always bugs him because i'll, I'll do like an entire like 16 pin chip and be like well i'm done bro what's wrong with you and he gets all bent out of shape uh but only because he makes it a competition you know uh but it's fun hardware's fun absolutely yeah. anything else come on i'm curious because you're talking about going to like def con and stuff do you know those guys that are doing they're like they're pulling images off i ran into them like uh in lompoc a while back um and you might know what they're doing. So they they had this antenna, and they were it, like they were pointing it into the sky at um, what was it like a uh, 
can't remember the name of the satellite, but they were pulling images off of the satellite using the, that. yeah, and they were using a hack RF for that. Yeah. Do, do you know, yeah. do you know the guys that were doing that? I don't friends? know the, I don't know the guys that were doing it, but I know this, I know that, um, that if there, you, sorry, if, no, 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 if, I don't know them personally, no, but I've been seeing a lot of Hackasat stuff. DEF CON has been developing a CTF around hacking satellites for the last two or three years. And okay. this year is the first time they've really got something put together. Um, if you go on Twitter and just do some type of hack a, hack a sat with a hyphen around the A, um, you'll see their tweets. Or if you go to uh, if you go to defcon.org and find the villages, you might be able to um, go into the RF village. You might be able to find stuff on that. Um, I have uh, I have an STR software or SDR software defined radio. Um, mm. and like some of the first tutorials uh that you come across when you get them is how to get information from the airplanes overhead how to wow. how to pull information from um satellites not everything is encrypted so that means that everything that's not is just in the air yeah if that's what they were doing is they were just like oh yeah this is just like public domain <laughs> you can just grab this yeah and it's got weather uh data and stuff yeah, so the weather, yeah, the W, what is it, W-O-A-A or something like that? I think, no, it was, um, no, was Noah. It? Was it Noah? N-O-A? I think so. Noah, yeah. Noah, you can 16? Geo, yeah. It was one of them that's geostationary, so it's not one of the close ones. It's, yeah. yeah. That stuff's amazing, and I wish that I'd started, so that's, like, when I was still in school, a lot of stuff seemed too intimidating for me to try to do. So I would try to learn something new and I'd only get like 10% into it. And then I'd hit a wall of stuff that I didn't understand. Been there. Um, I wish that I would have just kept going with it. I wish that I would have taken advantage of the meetup app um, recently. So like I got into lock picking uh, over the last <laughs> and I, I have a set around here somewhere. I love it. It's, it's so fun. <laughs> it's, it's there's something about just like with, with, uh, with, with devices and stuff, it's different, but like, with um with a physical, physical lock, animal. you can like feel the click and attack. It. It's just like yeah. So so uh yeah yeah. So I was at work. So a couple people at work like are into it too a little bit. And uh, I so what I was saying about the meetups real quick was that um there's a so DefCon has a lot of lock picking stuff going on. Hmm. Um, but just if you look on the meetup app, you can find meetups that just have stuff that you're interested in. Um, I mean, word space. Was it word space? Yeah, like words. Is it word space? Is that the blogging uh, software? I, I think WordPress is WordPress. Like a... There's WordPress meetups. Like, what do you have to say about WordPress? No, Word, WordPress is a site building thing. It might just be word space. No, uh, I think it's WordPress. That's the blogging application. Yeah, it's with the big W on the. Gotcha. Blog. Okay. Yeah, so like you can find meetups. I found a great, it's called uh, Null Space Laboratories. So I'm down in Ventura County right now, but not far from here, North Hollywood, uh, Burbank, actually, it's right next to the airport. <laughs> you know, I showed up and it was like a free meetup once a month. I walked in and there was every everything from one pin locks, right? A one pin lock yeah. to five pins to um, safe dials. And the when I showed up that day, the topic that day was safe dial cracking, and oh. um, the guy who was who ran that Null Space Labs, he's some professor, some just cool dude. Kind of reminded me of Jorstad. He's some professor at CSUN, and this is just the bungalow that he rents. Oh, um, whoa! I'm looking at photos of the Null Space. Yeah, yeah. amazing, dude, amazing. And uh, like I said, it was free, but I I learned how to pick a, a dial safe um like that sounds fun it takes a very long time it takes a very long time and i'm sure like the yeah. really sensitive hand too yeah um uh, yeah but uh yeah i took my nephew um like my 18 year old nephew because i was i've been trying to encourage him to you know look at school and um look to uh just kind of expand the possibilities in his life and he picked uh from one to five pins that night i was going to say by it yeah it's a lot of it Computers, I mean, it's not as solo as it used to be. Uh, it used to be the guy or girl by themselves, you know, in a room at night. I mean, even when I was, honestly, my very first computer was kind of like that. Um, when I was maybe 10, nine, no, I was in third grade. Yeah, nine years old, you know, I had one of those old uh, 380s or something. 
and uh, I used to play the snake game and uh, I try could never get Dungeons and Dragons to quite load. You know, and then I didn't touch a computer again for 20 years. Um, 